So if you ever think your hobbies are boring, not as boring as that. Um, we know anterior, intermediate, intermediate, posterior, and panuveitis. So it's where the predominant site of inflammation is. So you're allowed to have a few cells floating around in the anterior vitreous, and it's still anterior uveitis, um, as long as most of the inflammation is in the anterior chamber. Um, intermediate uveitis, you can have vitreous cells, a few anterior cells, you can have optic nerve swelling, you can have macular edema, and even though those are, those are findings in the posterior pole, it does not count as being a posterior uveitis. So that's, I think, the most um, misused term, is calling intermediate uveitis with CME and optic nerve edema a panuveitis. We get a lot of referrals in for panuveitis, and it's just intermediate uveitis. So posterior uveitis has to have um, a focal inflammatory lesion in the choroid or retina to be considered posterior. And then panuveitis is when you have that in addition to anterior and, and intermediate uveitis. So. And I heard they've tested this before. Like if you see 10 cells in the anterior chamber, what level of inflammation that is. So a good rule is um, 10 is 1 plus, 20 is 2 plus, 30 is 3 plus. And then it just gets a little fuzzy right after that because technically up to 50 is still 3 plus. But um, if you have a hypopium, it's like automatically 4 plus because it means there's that many cells that are layering out. Um, and you know, we use the slit, slit beam at an angle with as bright as you can, magnified in a 1 by 1 millimeter box. And that's how to look for anterior chamber cell and flare. And then for flare, it's just grading the amount of detail that's obscured from the. Um, from how well you can see the iris and lens. So these are pretty subjective. Kind of hazy, hazy, very hazy. <laughs> and then vitreous, oh, that says add, because that was like a slide that I did this morning. <laughs> add, minus the add. Um, <laughs> vitreous haze grading is done with the 20 diopter. So you have the patient laying back, and you're looking with an indirect and a 20 diopter lens. That's how you officially grade vitreous haze. So. Um, if you see us in clinic and we're scribing, you know, talk, telling our scribes, they know that, like, I say anterior chamber cell and flare, and I may say, oh, there's two plus vitreous cell, but I never say the haze score until I'm with the indirect. So, and it's just based on how well you can make out the nerve. So, um, one is kind of hazy. Um, once you get to three plus, you're really having trouble making out the details of the nerve, and then four plus, you can't see the nerve. Um, so this review is going to be uveitic syndromes, and there's like a billion of them, and I'll spend some time going through them today, but there's certain ones that just, I'll be like, this is, just memorize this, and I'll skip a few slides, so you have the slides later that you can just go back and look over. Um, and then immunosuppression, I remember being tested on that like every year, like what's the toxicity of methotrexate. Um, Drug-induced uveitis, I know for a fact I missed a question on that on the real, on the OCAPs, which really bothered me, <laughs> and then HLA classes, so. Um, starting with anterior uveitis, HLA B27 automatically comes to mind ankylosing spondylitis, but there's four syndromes that are associated with uveitis and, and HLA B27. So, Reiter's or reactive arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, IBD, not IBS, and then um, psoriatic arthritis. So, we're familiar with this the fusing of the sacroiliac joints, bamboo spine. We see patients like this walk into our clinic. So, it's ankylosing spondylitis. Um, R-A-N-G-A-U, anyone know what that stands for? Recurrent, alternating, Yep, yep. So a lot of times we'll just say N-G-A-U, non-granulomatous anterior uveitis, but if you hear recurrent alternating non-granulomatous anterior uveitis, it's B27 like 99% of the time. Um, and the things that can kill you is the aortitis or valvular insufficiency pulmonary fibrosis, it's rare, but no, that's... Um, part of it. Inflammatory pattern, so you know everyone has some back pain, but if you ask them is it worse in the morning or does it wake you up from sleep and then it gets better throughout the day, that's inflammatory arthritis. Anyone know what this is? The term for this? Oh, this is part of the writers. So can't see, can't pee, can't climb a tree, that was the initial teaching. Um, the confusing part of it is the most common eye manifestation is conjunctivitis, not uveitis, but uveitis can be a part of it. So um, they get heel spur for formation and the skin lesion, which is that like crusting and peeling of their heels called keratoderma or blenorachicum. Um, and they're often B27 related. So this will be after, oh, I had food poisoning a month ago, now I have uveitis. 
So, and I've actually, I've definitely seen this. Like, people come in and, and they're, they, they don't know they're B27 positive. Maybe we haven't even checked for it. But they're like, oh, I had like food poisoning a few months ago, a really bad diarrheal illness, and then two months later they get UBIs. And I think that's on the spectrum of, of writers. So, um, my wife got this. Oh, really? Ooh. Didn't get UBIs, luckily. Oh, but had this. Arthritis and all that. Arthritis. Um, so, the bugs associated with it, cussy, C-U-S-S-Y, because you'd be cussing if you got this. So that's how I remembered it. Chlamydia, ureplasma, S-S, and then Y. That's how I remembered cussing. <laughs> oh, that looks disgusting. So in the future, if you're looking at these pictures, I have the picture first and then the syndrome after it. So it's confusing if you're just looking through the slides of like which picture goes with it. And like 90% of the time, I have the photo before I have the slide that talks about it. So um, this photo is of the skin lesions and in inflammatory bowel disease, pyoderma gangrenosum. So inflammatory bowel disease, it's most often with ulcerative colitis, but I've also seen anterior uveitis with Crohn's disease. Um, always ask about GI symptoms. And then which of the four syndromes is this one related to? Sorry, last one, psoriatic arthritis. So you get these nail changes, pitting, um, it says resorption of the phalanges. That just makes me go like, like it's literally like resorbing the bones because you have arthritis, it's like erosive. Um, and the uveitis only happens with the psoriatic arthritis, not patients with only psoriasis. So you have to ask about the arthritis changes. Okay, a guy walks in and he has red painful eye and you see anterior chamber cell and all this corneal swelling and he's 60 and it's unilateral. What do you think of first? Okay, but if there's like a lot of inflammation in the eye and maybe the pressure's only like 24. Could be fakeolytic, good. And this is another one. And what's like our number one anterior uveitis, unilateral, with corneal changes and high pressure? Eight, yeah, and some kind of viral uveitis. So, <laughs> hey docs, I also have this rash. Uh. <laughs> then you know what it is. So zoster can be um, any kind of corneal changes. So, you know, we look for dendrites or pseudodendrites, but any, it can be endotheliitis. If I see anterior uveitis and like pretty much any corneal swelling of any type does my membrane fold, I think um, either zoster or HSV. And that's the segmental iris atrophy, high IOP, decreased corneal sensation. The KPs can really vary. Um, workup, none, right? He has that rash, you know what it is. Caveat, if he has zoster and he's 25, check HIV. So you must dilate every patient with uveitis. And we know management, I don't think they ask you doses on the test. So steroids are okay with herpetic diseases as long as they're being covered with antiviral in addition. Um, if they have a dendrite, maybe start the antivirals first. And then, this was a great quote from ha, our Dr. Vitalian Foster book. It's widely believed that uveitis associated with involvement of any corneal layer is a manifestation of herpetic disease until proven otherwise. And some patients need just a little bit, so this is not gonna test you on this, forget this part. That's all very practical stuff that they're not gonna test you on. Okay, little girl, funny joints, white stuff on the front of her cornea, band keratopathy, JIA. So um, JAA it typically is asymptomatic. They don't get red eyes, pain, photophobia. It's often bilateral chronic smoldering, goes undiagnosed for a long time because kids don't know to complain of blurry vision. They lose vision from the structural complications like CME, cataracts, glaucoma. Um, and it's the highest risk in female, young females with ANA and posiarticular. And posiarticular is the same as oligoarticular. I don't know why there's two names for it. They've always driven me nuts. That's the same thing. <laughs> Immunosuppressed early to prevent structural complications. There's a, um, a good study that showed JA patients that referred early on to a tertiary center that does like immunosuppression had like decreased visual loss over many years and decreased structural complications. So we do encourage our community private providers for JA to just refer it to here. Can I ask a question? Yeah. A little off topic. Uh, do you use organic kids? 
They use what? Zergan and kids who have. Um, not typically, but I also don't use a lot of topical antivirals in general. I think I've used it like once. So. Um, they love this screening chart. I don't know. I remember being asked this. I literally have a mental block against this chart. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are provider, and I have a mental block against this chart. So the thing to remember is the only ones that's three months is like young, girl, new onset, A and A, right? So she was diagnosed early. You haven't followed her for a long time. Uh, actually, it doesn't include girl, but that's more, more high risk. Um, and then most everything else is six months until you've been following them for long enough, and then it's 12 months. And then systemic disease, even though it sounds worse, doesn't have as much uveitis. So that's Stills disease, which is like more systemic fever, chills, all that stuff. <sighs> if anyone has a better way to remember it, let me know. Well, we were talking about this when we were studying one time, <clears throat> and I just memorized the columns. So it's like, it's like three criteria, essentially, because only your arthritis, probably others you already know, and then systemic disease you know. So if they have all three, then it's three months. If they have two, it's six months, except if they've had really long follow-up greater than seven years, then it's just... It's back to 12. It's one. So it's just like columns is what I memorized, like you said. But. I don't understand that one where it's age of onset. Oh, onset, okay. is less than six, but then they've had it for seven years. Yes. Okay. Continue. Mm -hmm. Think of this if you have a kid with bilateral anterior uveitis that is symptomatic, right? That's not your JIA patient. B27 in young kids can be the exception to that rule. But, so if you have, and it can be even a young adult that comes in and they have simultaneous onset of, of symptomatic anterior uveitis and continue. And so if you just check your standard labs and you do even like a UA and a creatinine, you can miss it. All those labs can be totally normal. And then you can check a beta 2 microglobulin in the urine, not the serum, and it can be like 10,000 times the upper limit of normal, but you would have missed the diagnosis if you hadn't checked the rest of the labs. And then official diagnosis is kidney biopsy, um, but there's criteria of like probable and things like that that doesn't require the biopsy. And they actually tend to do well once you have them on immunosuppression. So this is a, a good practical case I took from another one of my lectures um, about intermediate uveitis. I'm not going to like waste all the time going over it but there's a few slides I'll point out. So floaters, non-painful, kind of any age, or age range, but a lot of time young, otherwise healthy adults. Um, that's intermediate uveitis, so and a vitreous cell, and they can even have the nerve swelling, vascular sheathing on exam, exudates, NCME, and it's not panuveitis, it's intermediate uveitis. So differential diagnosis, number one, idiopathic, number two, sarcoid, number three, MS. Remember those, idiopathic sarcoid MS. And then a whole bunch of infectious ones, um, which, you know, take a history, make sure there's no choreoretinal lesions. That's what pushes me more towards it being in infectious. But you can have intermediate uveitis just with syphilis and Bartonella, things like that. This is the FA, the circle showing like what we used to see with just without the wide field, so that could look fairly normal, and then when you expand, you see a lot of peripheral retinal vascular leakage and that fern-like pattern that's really classic for intermediate uveitis. Ask about review systems. This is a relative workup to do. Um, classic findings, you know. This is some interesting facts. Do you know smoking is associated with CME and intermediate uveitis, independent than any of anything else? So another reason not to smoke. Um, the connection between MS and intermediate uveitis is real, um, but we don't just do MRIs for everyone with intermediate uveitis. We ask about neurologic symptoms. But they're both autoimmune diseases. Autoimmune diseases run together, so it's a much higher prevalence over the general population. Management, no. just topical steroids is the wrong answer. <laughs> Not every vitreous cell needs to go away. Anterior chamber cells, we'd like them all to go away. Vitreous cells we can live with because they can float around the vitreous for a long time. They don't cause problems necessarily. They don't cause structural issues. Sometimes they get just trapped in young vitreous that's sticky. Um, so you don't have to go to like zero vitreous cells. We like zero haze or trace haze or less. So when we think of active intermediate uveitis, we're really basing it on what we look with the 20 and how much haze there is. And CME, you know, structural changes. 
Okay, new, new pictures. So if you're looking at the blood vessels in the top here, it like stops abruptly. I don't see any blood vessels in this area. There's a bunch of dot hemorrhages. On FA, it corresponds to a lack of blood flow or non-perfusion in this area. So it's a retinal vasculitis that has um, occlusion and non-perfusion beyond it. So this is a occlusive retinal vasculitis. Think of the scary systemic things like um, lupus, vichettes, and that's what this one is. So generalized occlusive vasculitis can be associated with hypopian uveitis. Um, and then it's mouth and general ulcers, much more common in Mediterranean, um, Middle Eastern descent. And then the good differential diagnosis for a hypopian, always think of in real life when we see hypopian, it's almost never Bichette's because we live in Utah. Um, it's more often HLV 27 in the United States in general, but worldwide hypopian, non-infectious is Bichette's. Um, and ophthalmitis, always think of it in a patient that doesn't have recent surgery. If they're like an IV drug user or have systemic illness, it can be endogenous and ophthalmitis. And then tumor can be a pseudohypopian, so you know, retinal blastoma, things that can layer out lymphoma, leukemia, and look like hypopian, that's really not. Um, and then another pseudohypopian is the lens, lens induced it, uveitis. And then steroid, why is steroid can be a, look like a hypopian? Does anyone know that one? If you inject like intravitreal triacins or you inject steroid and it ends up in the wrong part of the eye, it looks like a hypopian. Okay, this is still for Bichette's, 25% have CNS involvement, that's why it can kill you. Um, HLA B51, it's a clinical diagnosis. So the HLA testing, I think, is confirmatory, but we don't screen patients with UVI with B51 testing. And then the pathogy test, do you guys know what this is? So you like stick a, a needle, tiny little needle under the skin, and you inject like a really, really tiny, like 0.1 or 0.01 amount of saline, and then you check 24 to 48 hours la later, and like the normal person, it goes away, you can't see it at all, and patients with um, Bichette's develop this little pustule or papule. Um, but this only happens in like a small percentage of patients with Bichette's. So it's not, if they, do, if they don't get this, it means, it doesn't mean that they don't have Bichette's, but if they do have it, then you can get this. So, um, I've never done this. But. Okay, nodules on the iris margin, what are those called? Kepi, Kepi on the cliff. <laughs> and buried, <laughs> is buried. Uh, so. That's a nodule, that's a nodule. That is a KP. What would we call that kind of KP? What kind of KP? Would, like, how would you describe that KP? Yeah, mutton fat or granulomatous. So this is granulomatous disease. And what's the nodule and angle called? Berlin's. Yeah. So differential diagnosis for granulomatous inflammation. You know, they always separate this in your textbook. A lot of times there's crossover, but pure granulomatous definitely thinks sarcoid, TB, and then other things can go back and forth. Toxo, syphilis, even herpetic can be. Um, and then VKH and sympathetic is definitely granulomatous. So sarcoid, um, up to, you know, 50% or so can have eye involvement. Um, anterior uveitis is the most common, but we also know that sarcoid is the most common known cause of intermediate uveitis. And then um, there's a whole bunch of different posterior manifestations. So we have a lot of pictures. This is the um, non-caseating granuloma. Um, so look in the angle, tent-shaped PAS, apparently is very specific for sarcoid, so that's what they're showing here, it's just like a PAS that's in a little triangle. Um, nodules, that's a Berlin nodule. I think these are supposed to show little chororetinal lesions in the periphery, um, and, sit, and then some exudates. And then there's also candle wax drippings, um, this is actually what we see a lot in clinic, is that there's these peripheral, almost atrophic appearing yellow little spots in, in, in the retina, inferiorly. I see that a lot in sarcoid. Hemorrhages, macroaneurysms, so intermediate uveitis with weird posterior changes, and you've ruled out infection, and there's some blood, but there's not like retinal whitening that looks like ARN, can end up being sarcoid. But a lot of these, them can get treated as ARN initially. By hyalur lymphadenopathy, it can be like evanescent apparently and come and go, so you may not catch it on every chest x ray. If you have a high suspicion, do a chest CT um, if, you, if you think it could be sarcoid because they can pick up changes on CT. And then the lacrimal gland involvement, I think they ask about this, and it may show like a path slide. Different things they can have. Conjunctival nodules, I think it's like up to 70% of patients not treated 
not currently on steroids for sarcoid can have these like conge nodules and that's an easy spot to biopsy. And then I just got cut off a little bit. Okay, so lens associated uveitis. These are the ones I can never get straight in my mind. Is there, um, what's the mechanism of glaucoma in sarcoid patients? Is it, is it the, the Berlin nodules or tenting? It's a good question. I, I don't know. I think it's probably a combination of, of inflammatory, like uveitic, and then there may be um, there may be something in their optic nerve, like some sarcoid changes in their optic nerve. I actually don't know if it's just because they have uveitis and they're exposed to steroids and they have inflammation, which causes glaucoma, if there's something else in sarcoid that makes them more susceptible. I'm not sure. Um, so UGG syndrome, that's when you get recurrent hyphemas, inflammation, worry about the lens position, um, it can happen with certain types of lenses in the sulcus. What kind do we not put in the sulcus? One piece, yeah. Single, no sulcus. And um, you can treat you can treat the inflammation with steroids, but then it typically recurs, so a lot of times it needs lens repositioning. Phacolytic. So I remember it's like phacolytic, meaning lens lysing through. These, these names always confuse me. So that's how I remember. I just think this real big fat lens and it's like so big, it's like breaking through. So that's phacolytic. So it's a really hypermature lens and it's starting to like literally lice through an otherwise intact lens capsule. So you, you haven't had surgery, you haven't had trauma, um, but you can get inflammation in it, what looks like inflammation in the eye. So this is not real inflammation in the eye. There's no KPs. Um, it can look like a pseudo hypopian, but it's just like the lens proteins leaking through as opposed to lens particle glaucoma, which are the actual pieces of lens particles that, have, that are in the anterior chamber and clogging the correct trabecular meshwork after there's been a disruption of, of the lens capsule. Um, but there's no KP. As opposed to phacoantigenic, which is real inflammation in response to lens pieces. So try to remember what these look like on path because they'll show you different path slides and one of them is like the ma macrophages and all the stuff around a lens particle and that's what's clogging the trabecular meshwork versus just like a little piece of cortex in without the inflammatory cells around it. So that's the difference between lens particle and phacoantigenic on path slides. Um, and they get KPs in the last one because it's like really is an inflammatory response to lens particles. A lot of the um, treatments are the same. Okay, what's the name for what this guy has? Not the syndrome. Mm -hmm. Heterochromia, good. <laughs> and what's a good differential <laughs> diagnosis for heterochromia if we weren't in uveitis lecture? Okay, okay General Horners. Okay, yeah? Yeah. Fuchs, obviously, because we're in uveitis lecture. And then what else is like, could be a potentially scary thing? Iris melanoma. Um, and then when you see these stellate KP, so stellate is like small and kind of star-like and they go floor to ceiling. So instead of just being on the lower third or lower two thirds of the cornea, they're the whole thing. This is a blurry picture of trying to show fine vessels crossing the um, angle. So that's why they bleed, they can bleed during cataract surgery. Amsler sign. So Fuchs, 10% um, bilateral. If it's on your test, it's gonna be unilateral. Um, Synechii don't form, and that's why you don't have to treat the anterior chamber inflammation. So it's usually mild anterior chamber inflammation um, that is like hard to treat with prednisolone, but you don't really have to worry. You can leave, this is like the one exception to the rule. You can leave like trace cells or one plus cells floating around the anterior chamber. It doesn't tend to cause the same problems as the rest of uveitity. So it's not causing CME and posterior synechii. So, um, some question of association with rubella, and um, they lose vision from glaucoma. So no cyclopegia, no steroids, you treat the IOP. And you can have um, a anterior vitreous cells in this as well, it's fairly common. So we talked about this. At what point during their course do they actually develop the heterochromia? Like would they come in with the heterochromia? So it has to be, if they already have heterochromia, it means it's been there a while, because it's, it's like, gets worse with time, heterochromia. So, so like it won't be patient, initially. Like if a patient came in not having heterochromia yeah. and then had the anterior You would treat it because you'd think it's still iritis. Yeah, yeah. And then it's usually like with years you realize, oh, hey, they now their eye color's changing and they've never had posterior synechia and so then it becomes more obvious. Posner Schlossman, 
not sure if this really exists or if it's just undiagnosed herpetic anterior uveitis, possibly. Um, so, um, but really high IOP, like intermittent really high IOP with inflammation. Um, think of Posner Schlossman. I also would almost always give him a course of Paltrex just in case. And then hypertensive uveitis, herpetic, Fuchs, um, syphilis, toxo. Add CMV to that list as well. Okay. Retinal whitening, hemorrhages. You think of like viral necrotizing retinitis, right? So this is why we dilate every patient. If you just looked in with your little 90 and <coughs> saw this nice little macula, yeah, it looks good, but you could be missing all this in the periphery. And this is like the one disease that changes in, in 48 hours if you miss the boat, if you miss it on your first exam. So, oh, this is like missing number one. There it is. <laughs> so, um, the kind of confusing thing is necrotizing retinitis can happen in, t happen in totally normal people or in immunocompromised patients, but they have like different forms. So ARN, which is like the fast, scary one, happens to just a normal, healthy individual that has crap luck. And then progressive outer retinal necrosis and CMV retinitis happens in immunocompromised patients. So, and they have very similar features. Uh, if you just looked at a picture, you wouldn't know. Like if they show you a picture, you cannot choose between these three. You have to know like the time course, number one, and patient's immune status. Um, high risk of retinal attachment even with treatment. Um, treatment is actually very similar for all of them. And then we'll go into, so I, I typically do oral Valtrex with two grams TID, which is equivalent to the acyclovir IV dose, and then intravitreal ibuprofen or gancyclovir every few days until absolute improving, and add steroids. Um, so for ARN, this is the ones that happen in normal patients, and it happens really, really quickly. So if you said, if they come in and they said, you know, six weeks ago, I noticed a little bit of blurriness, and they're still 20-20, it's not ARN. So this is like 48 hours, I woke up with floaters, and now I'm count fingers, okay? Um, and it typically starts in the periphery, white patches that begin to coalesce, there's a lot of botrytis. In younger people, it's usually HSV, in older people, it's usually BCV. And the other eye becomes involved. So this, you know, this is a viral retinitis. I don't know which one, but progressive outer retinal necrosis. This, this is like ARN in both in immunocompromised patients. So it's fast, it's scary, but it doesn't have the botrytis. It's otherwise very, very similar. So um, no botrytis. You saw that amount of retinal whitening, and there's no botrytis. Think HIV and and progressive outer retinal necrosis in comparison to CMV. So this is kind of brush fire appearance along the arcade. This could be any of the three, but that appearance along the arcade and it's starting a little more in the posterior pole compared to the periphery, I would think CMV, but you have to have a time course. This could be like, I didn't know anything was wrong, and you see this on exam. Or this started six months ago, and it looks like this. So different changes, retinal whitening, you know, the little patches that coalesce. And so immunocompromised patients, um, the C, this is how I was taught, the C stands for chronic, so CMV is slow. 250 microns a week, that means it moves a half of this diameter in like a month, three weeks. That's really, really slow. So um, this is the one you have time to think about it, right? Like you, you treat it as iron, and then you can think about it, and if it's CMV, ends up being CMV. Um, two different kinds you guys learn about like the pizza pie fundus and a lot of like blood and yellow and like hemorrhage and, and white but that's the fulminant kind i've more often seen the indolent granular kind which can be like this it's just a big swath of retina that's like kind of depigmented and pigment changes to me this looks inactive but there was like a white border here he could just still have really slow indolent cmb retinitis that's the kind that's like missed a lot and treated as anterior uveitis for six months. And then you're like, oh, you're immunosuppressed from whatever. Okay, moving on, time here. Cotton wool spots, hemorrhages, could be radiation retinopathy, could be diabetic retinopathy, could be HIV retinopathy, they're all the same. And it's not infectious, it goes away once their CD4 counts improve. Buzzwords: retinal whitening adjacent to a pigmented scar, toxoplasmosis. 
This one should have vitritis. This is like a clear view, which is kind of confusing. Usually it's associated with vitritis. Sometimes it's a clear view, and there's just like a little clump of vitritis right over that lesion. That could be pretty typical. And um, it's a focal retinitis, so the inflammation in the retina is here, but like way out here on the side, there may be vascular sheathing and like peri, um, perivenular sheathing and, and vasculitis. That's pretty common for toxo. So uncooked meat, soil, um, cat poop, it occurs at the edge of an old scar. If they have HIV, check the brain. Classic treatment, pyrimethamine, sulfadiazine, and folinic acid, not folic acid. And then I think when they say triple therapy, they actually mean prednisone with those three. And then there's like a million other things that work. A stalk, picture of a stalk, like a kid, and there's a stalk from the nerve. Those are like the buzzwords for toxocara. Young people, I think in, in your manual, there's like three different kinds. Or something. White dot syndromes. Okay, I remember this just being like a blur of similar syndromes when I was studying about it. And now I'm like, I don't, they're like not that similar at all. But try to remember certain things about them to like delineate them. So older person, nyctalopia, that's a bad picture, but multiple ovoid cream colored lesions scattered throughout the posterior pole and they have floaters. Birdshot, okay. ICG, they're showing you an ICG. For the love of God, I just hope it's birdshot. <laughs> showing an ICG for it. So these um, hypofluorescent lesions on ICG, more on ICG than exam or FA or, or anything else. Um, so it's usually older people, floaters, HLA A29.2, I think they asked me that in one of the tests. Um, and it's, <laughs> just to be picky. <laughs> They all need immunosuppression, and we follow them with fields and ERGs. Snake-like appearance, maybe originating from the optic nerve, surfaces. <laughs> <laughs> Older people, it tends to be really bad. Can need alkylating agents, those are strong medications. Um, block early stain late, those are kind of buzzwords for ampy and serpiginous. Um, so it's dark early and it gets bright later. That's all that means. Mutes. If you have to remember one thing about mutes, it's unilateral. It's Just remember that. <laughs> it's <actually> unilateral. <laughs> um, and they're small little spots. So that's like, you're like, oh, if they're young, you're kind of myopic, they had a viral program, it could be ampy. No, unilateral, small dots, mutes, ampy, bigger dots, bilateral. So, oops, tiny little dots. Um, the foveal granularity is supposed to be like pathognomonic, which is insane because so many things have foveal granularity, but um, for testing purposes. And then ampi. I always thought, on the, this is like the stock photo from, I swear, what they use on the test. And it looks like someone took like cotton balls and dipped them in yellow dye and <laughs> threw them onto the <laughs> picture, right? And like little cotton ball spots, which is totally different than the pictures they use for anything else. Like this is the ampi picture. Um, Viral prodrome, young adults, block early, stain late. That's a good picture of block early, stain late. So it's dark and then it's bright. Most do well, some don't. Okay, hmm. now you're kind of between the size of mute spots and ampy spots. They're kind of small, but they're bilateral. So pick, pick or multifocal, little spots everywhere. So pick and multifocal, um, probably on a spectrum, Technically, PIC has no vitritis and, um, and only involves the posterior pole, and multifocal has vitritis and goes into the periphery. <coughs> I've seen some that lie in between. Um, and they both have, can have CNBMs. Um, syphilis, as we know, it can do anything. The masquerader can happen in any stage of syphilis. It can look like anything. That's why we always test for it. And then uveitis, we treat it as neurosyphilis, even if the LP is negative. But you still get the LP because it can be helpful to follow um, response to treatment over time. Lyme disease, um, I've never seen this because we live in Utah. But they'll test you on it. Most of the uveitis and keratitis happens in the um, stage two, can be intermediate uveitis, the targetoid lesions, and um, treat with you know, tetracyclines. Sympathetic ophthalmia, this is granulomatous inflammation um, in an eye that's had trauma, essentially. And trauma can be a vitrectomy. 
Um, for OCAP's purposes, it spares the choriocapillaris, and BKH doesn't. I don't know if that's really true, but if you see um, neurosensory detachments and inflammation, think of this disease. Dale and Fuchs, Fuchs nodules are um, in collections of like epithelioid cells between RPE and Fuchs membrane. And those are good old lung fat KP right there. And then these like multiple punctate um, staining on FA. And that's the, that collection. This is a good path slide. That would be a good question. So you see this, a path slide, and then they give you like, a history of inflammation. And that's the Dale and Fuchs nodule. BKH, very, very similar, um, but no previous trauma. They all need immunomodulatory therapy, and they like the, the systemic symptoms they get with it, so like the ringing in the ears, they get like menig meningitis, tinnitus, and um, the poliosis, so they can have like a flop, like a piece of white hair, or a section of their eyelashes that are white, or patches of their skin that turn white. And this is pinpoint leakage on FA, and then it pools in the areas of neurosensory detachment. And this can be like 2,400, and you give them 60 oral prep, and they come back two days later, and they're at 2,030. It's pretty remarkable. Lymphoma, um, always think of lymphoma. If you see intermediate uveitis in like a 65-year-old, or you're like, oh, this is your first bout of intermediate uveitis, and you're 75, think of lymphoma. And this is a picture of something. is trying to show is um, an IOL with um, <laughs> forgot an IOL with like particulate on it like debris uh, stuck on an IOL so that's chronic endophthalmitis like piacnes yeah it's so hard to tell what layer they're talking about <laughs> chronic endophthalmitis so um, recurrent inflammation <laughs> years after can get better with steroids and then keeps coming back in an eye with surgery always think of um, chronic endophthalmitis and treat it like endophthalmitis tap and inject and often needs lens removal Okay, red eye. Red eye, and it doesn't hurt. It's probably just like conjunctivitis. But if it's tender to touch, and it's painful, and they're not saying like itchy and watery, think episcleritis or scleritis. And there may be a little nodule. So 50% of scleritis, we can find an etiology. About 50% we don't. Um, but some of the etiologies are pretty scary. Um, so rheumatoid arthritis is the most common. Um, infectious is, you know, only one out of ten, and the most common is herpetic, so it's still not like they need biopsies or anything like that. And then for anterior scleritis, we have diffuse and nodular, and we treat them very similarly. And then for our necrotizing scleritis, there's the white, quiet, non-painful kind, which is called scleromalacial perforans, and then there can be necrotizing scleritis that's in the setting of like a red painful eye like this. Um, and I've seen this with, with Wegner's and it can definitely happen with RA as well. So this is a very grainy picture of a macular star. So if someone has nerve swelling um, and exudates in their macula, especially if it's in both eyes. Yeah, it's very much right now. If you see like neurosensory detachments and nerve swelling and some exudates. What do you want to make sure it doesn't kill the patient? It's not uveitis. Malignant hypertension. So always think of that when you see like exudates and nerve swelling and your like brain goes down the uveitis pathway. Think first, check their blood pressure. But unilateral, 20 year old, probably Bartonella. Um, cat scratch. We typically treat with doxycycline or steroids, but there's apparently no evidence that it changes the course of the disease. Like they tend to get better anyways if it's cat scratch. But there is a subset of just idiopathic recurrent that needs immunosuppression. Okay, so this is a little bonus round. If you think it's like unilateral RP, think of these other things first. Old syphilis, actually even old CMV retinitis, it's inactive and all that granular um, changes in, in the periphery could be, look like RP and it could be old CMV retinitis. Um, syphilis can have that granular appearance or this entity called Duzin, which is diffuse unilateral subacute retinitis. It's literally a worm crawling around your retina. It's really disgusting. We've had one recently. Um, and then I think they like to test on the things that cause it. I think in North America, 
Um, the raccoon one, that's not how you spell raccoon, is the most common. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, try to burn the worm, but they're like, the worms are photosensitive, guys. So it's hard because you turn on the light and then the worm runs away. But if you can get it, you blast the worm like you with photocoagulation. Otherwise, all then dissolve in steroids. Okay, immunosuppression. This is just like step back. I mean, you hear all these different immunosuppressive. Think of the categories, right? Because it can help you with the side effects because then you just put it into that category and it helps you with like how we actually use them. We don't use two from the same category, right? So anti-metabolites, there's three. Methotrexate, Celsept, azathioprine. Mycophenolate, the Celsept. Then calcineurin inhibitors. We use cyclosporine more often than tacrolimus, but you can use either. And then alkylating agents. I should put the one down here because we kind of go like in this order. Um, alkylating agents are the ones that have the really scary side effects, may cause cancer, but actually the only ones to show that it induces remission. All the other ones like don't really induce remission. You get off the drug and if, it, and if the disease hasn't finished its course that it's going to take, it can come back. And we think cyclophosphamide can actually induce remission. And then TNF agents, um, infliximab, that's IV. Adalimumab is the humanized monoclonal antibody to TNF, and it's subinjection, subcutaneous injection. Etanercept, old frowny face. Enbrel is the only one we don't use in uveitis. Like pretty much every immunosuppression you can think of helps uveitis if they're using it for anything else, with the exception of Enbrel. We think it is either not helpful or potentially deleterious. So, Enbrel, no uveitis. It may actually be like worse than placebo. Um, oh, that's nice. Didn't finish that slide. So tocilizumab is one of the, the newer ones that there's a recent good study showing it helps with vitreous haze and CME. So we're going to just pick like one from each category for anti-metabolites, methotrexate, dihydrate, folate reductase inhibitor. Um, the folic acid can prevent a lot of the side effects, um, and this is how. Just, just read through the slide. Um, and I think this is kind of the things to know. Myelosuppression, suppression, hepatotoxicity, don't get pregnant, don't drink alcohol. Oops. Cyclosporine, calcineurin inhibitor. We usually don't use cyclosporine alone. Actually, I can say I have never used cyclosporine alone, but we use it as like adjunct therapy in addition to one of the ones from the previous category, especially in a birdshot or VKH, you can add it to methotrexate or Celsept. Uh, the big ones to remember is it's nephrotoxic, hypertension, um, <laughs> Cyclophosphamide, it's the mustard DNA crosslinker that um, is cytotoxic, and bone marrow suppression, hemorrhagic cystitis, which apparently you can um, prevent by drinking a lot of water and taking mesna, and then cancers. There's like several studies that show that it can increase lymphoma, non melanoma skin cancers, um, and bladder cancer. Anti-TNF inhibitors, the contraindications, heart failure, hep C, MS, untreated TB. You can use this in latent TB if they're on treatment for it. And it can induce a lupus-like syndrome. So the drug-induced uveitis that says infliximab, it's usually in a setting of infliximab inducing like a lupus-like syndrome, and then they get scleritis or uveitis. Enbrel may actually like worsen or cause anterior uveitis. That's debated. But. And so we typically will use um, low-dose methotrexate in addition to anti-TNF um, because I think it helps the anti-TNF work better and it prevents the chimeric antibodies that makes it ineffective. So Enbrel can make sarcoid and GIA uveitis worse. And then this is a little bonus thing I think they ask you on. TNF inhibitors can make multiple sclerosis worse. So what's the disease that we treat a lot in uveitis that can be associated with MS. Intermediate uveitis, yes. So if you're thinking of starting your intermediate uveitis patient on a TNF inhibitor, like you've already used methotrexate and it's not working, you want to add Humira, consider getting an MRI, ask a big neuro history. Okay, drug-induced uveitis, this is the definite systemic categories. Sidofovir, ripabutin, bisphosphonates, I missed that one on my test, um, and sulfonamides. So this treats CMV, MAC, osteoporosis, just remember those. And then this is probable for anti-TNF agents. 
and then maybe category down here. What's an acronym? Ethylene something carboxylamine. I can't remember what it treats. No, oh, okay. Mac. Um, Michael. Oh, Michael. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then topical definite. This is a topical beta blocker that was used to treat glaucoma, but it was at a higher dose of 0.6, and it apparently definitely called anterior uveitis, and it's no longer in the market. So I don't think all topical beta blockers call, cause uveitis, but apparently this one, they had some pretty good evidence that it did with like rechallenging. Um, bromonidine, there's like a lot of reports of granulomatous anterior uveitis with bromonidine. Um, I haven't personally seen it. And then prostaglandin analogs like latanoprost, uh, they always mention that it can cause CME or reactivate HSV keratitis. Um, but it is like more recent studies shown that in patients with uveitis, or like from something else, that using prostaglandin analogs does not cause CME and it does not worsen or exacerbate their anterior uveitis. So we use prostaglandins in patients with known anterior uveitis. And then topical steroids was on the list of drug-induced uveitis, which really confused me. But they meant withdrawal of the steroids can cause uveitis. Steroids don't cause uveitis. And then reports of um, intravitreal VEGF injections causing uveitis, there can be like a sterile inflammatory response, um, things like that. HLA associations. B27 and A29 are about 7 or 8% in the general population anyways. So that's like 1 in 13, so we don't just screen for it, right? What if it's the right scenario? And then intermediate uveitis and DR15.